Let's talk about the most exciting thing that you'll ever hear, right? More so for the past three days. So let's see. OK, I see. Secure PLC coding. OK, this is the agenda for the next 75 enthralling minutes, OK? I will be captivating and spellbound. We'll quickly go through uh, what to expect in the session, right? We'll talk a little bit about our project. We'll go through some examples, uh, some closing thoughts for the future, and happy to take any questions, OK? And quick uh, format. What we have today is a bunch of slides, a lot of pictures. So we'll talk over it. And if you really want to dig deeper into the code itself, you want the config files, give us a shout, send me an email. Uh, we'll get that to you. But for the most part, we'll be talking about uh, the content on a picture format, right? And then we'll go through some examples. Introduction about our project. So let's see if that works. OK. Top 20 list, most of you probably heard of it, and that's why you're here. So we have the website info there, email contact as well. You'll know, um, you know, talk to Jake, talk to Isaiah. You know, you'll get the background about how this started, where it is. You have a bunch of videos on there for intros. Uh, this talk will go a little bit deeper into those practice examples, so we're not going to talk about the intro. But of these eight that are underlined, Josh is going to talk about the first four, and I'm going to take the next four. What we often hear, right, that PLCs are insecure by design. And you probably heard that many, many times. And to a large extent, it's true, right? But then the next conclusion drawn from it, that the OT security posture cannot be improved by uh, programming because it's insecure by design. The protocols are insecure, so you can't do much. That's what you hear, typically, right? You also hear that implementing any PLC level security would need newer platforms, newer protocols, newer everything, because, hey, they're better designed more modern, so you have to use them. So look at the other side of the picture. It is true to an extent, these things that we mentioned here. However, there are things that still can be done with existing PLCs, right? You can monitor, you can validate, you can verify, you can improve the um, resilience of the PLC architecture by improving the programming practices, which is how this project was started in the first place. So you can harden the PLC, you can improve the resilience, you can monitor uh, without using additional tools at the base level, right? There are things that the additional tools will get to you, right? However, there are things that you can fundamentally do, leveraging best practices, engineering practices in the PLC programming. And that's how um, you know, we are approaching this security improvements, right? So we're talking about security quite a bit, but we'll leverage many of the good engineering practices to get to better security. And Josh is going to talk about this security objectives and target groups and then take you to the next few examples. Okay. Yeah, so as we were kind of going through everything and starting to kind of uh, categorize the different practices that were out there, we kind of had a lot of different conversations about like what are the actual security objectives. And we were able to break it down into four separate categories. Um, obviously, being the highest one, integrity, uh, is what you're focused on the most with PLCs usually, right? You want your PLC to be functioning as designed, as expected, and protecting your um, your environmental and your physical cyberspace and your physical uh, environment. Um, so, but we, really, when you have a lot of conversations about security and PLC security, the first thing most people think of is hardening, because that's the way a lot of us cybersecurity engineers first think about things, right? Like, all right, how are we going to harden the device? The first conversation that comes up is, all right, we got to go put in passwords. Uh, how are we going to disable different protocols? But uh, as we really dug into this, that wasn't really where a lot of these practices and ideas came from the community, and we all sat down and were brainstorming together. Uh, there's still a different level of uh, monitoring items that can be done that may not be done through a number of different uh, platforms that are already out there today. So there's things that you can already do natively in the controllers and be leveraging. And then resilience is the last category. Uh, and then the further we got into this too and having the different conversations, we were talking about what are all the different target groups that you're going to be talking with. Because not all the practices or uh, different techniques that we were bringing up were really going to be valid from the, each part of the life cycle that the uh, code would be developed in um, or who would actually be adopting the practices. So uh, the first one is uh, in the life cycle really is like your product suppliers, right? So product suppliers is the first chance you really have to actually start hardening and improving your programming practices. And so when you actually start focusing on those folks, they, they have less constraints to some extent there, right? Because when you have it early on in the life cycle, 
you don't have to deal with what's my uptime at, at this time or this period in time. Uh, is this download going to be required? Um, what's this going to do um, to affect the current rating that it already has out there? Uh, you just have a lot more flexibility. Um, then you kind of move into the integration and maintenance providers, and they're really going to touch us at almost any point in its life cycle. They could be the ones developing your code. They could be the ones modifying it to integrate into your current systems. Uh, they could be the ones troubleshooting it late at night, trying to figure out what's going on. They're the ones making small changes that might just be operational improvements along the way. Um, and then the last one is the asset owners. They really may not be the ones who are actually doing all the programming, but they're the ones who may be putting together some of the standards that may be in place, putting the different requirements that may be there and needed. And so we would just kind of categorize these to help do a quick pass as to where you want to focus your eyes depending on where you sit or where you, what you're uh, responsible for. So we'll do some stage setting, but as we're moving through, uh, we're going to walk through the eight different items that we kind of want to highlight today from a secure coding example. Um, the top 20 items that were brought up was a big community that came together to create all these. And the idea is this isn't being talked about enough. I think Jake initially had brought up that a couple years ago, uh, that it just needs to be something that starts getting socialized and starts becoming a normal part of the, the daily conversation, that there is something you can do. It's a part of a uh, defense in depth strategy. And you just need to start thinking about it when you're starting to do the design, that what am I going to do today? So a lot of these practices that are going to be brought up they're not that complex to implement. They're a good way to start changing the perspective of folks who are doing the programming, the engineers who are designing it, the people who are developing the systems and building the systems. And so as we walk through each of these uh, different practices, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through, uh, outline the practice, give a quick overview of what the practice is, what the guidelines would be, uh, what the different benefits may be around it. And then we'll kind of put it in a real con a contextual scenario where we kind of describe an operate like a real world operating scenario. Uh, what insecure programming would do if an attacker were to step in, what the secure programming would do, so you can actually contextualize what making some of these changes could actually do uh, as far as improving your cybersecurity posture. Uh, of course, a lot of these are not going to stop an advanced uh, and persistent threat actor, but a lot of these can stop the, very, the really quick attacks and improve your posture overall where, they, where other compensating controls you may have in place combined with these just improve your overall posture. So the first practice we'll go through is uh, practice number three, which is leaving the operational logic in the PLC. So there's a lot of different vendors out there, different uh, ICS devices that can do some level of control, some level of logic, some level of, mo of controls within them. Uh, some different examples of that would be, say, your HMI can do, uh, it'll have a number of logic items that you can do in it. You can program in C, maybe you'll program in VB. In some rare cases, you may be even able to write some ladder logic in your HMI and have internal tags in there. Uh, on the flip side, if you start talking about uh, the like flow meters or flow controllers, they have a level of logic they can do in them as well. So a lot of this is trying to focus on leaving the operational logic in the PLC as opposed to spreading it out just because you can. Uh, when you're first developing it and developing a lot of this code, you may think this is, oh, this is great. It's actually way easier for me to develop this code in the HMI or do a little bit in the flow meter but you're not thinking long term of how you're going to be actually maintaining this and also the additional security risks that you may be introducing. So the idea here is to be really calculating and doing your controls in the most logical device and as close to the process as possible. There's other benefits around this that are not just security focused where you're going to improve your latency, you're going to make it easier to troubleshoot. I don't know if anybody's actually had to go out there and do maintenance in the middle of the night or try to get a process back up, and you haven't even ever seen the code. You get in the code and you start trying to troubleshoot it, and the code's spread out in the HMI and the PLC, maybe in a different controller, and you're spending a long time extending the downtime. You're very stressed trying to figure out where all this code's at, and some of these don't even have the best debugging features. So putting that aside, there's, there's other security features that are helpful within it. So uh, what we're going to do for describing this scenario, we're going to focus more on a, a simple like stage shutdown of a compressor system, which you could easily extrapolate out to uh, like any full processing facility. But what we're going to do here is we're going to talk about a stage shutdown that goes through a number of different just timed events. It's very simple. It moves through five different stages and has uh, a time delay between each stage before it moves on to the next stage which in a real environment, you may actually have a number of different interlocks or environmental scenarios that have to be met first before it moves on. But to keep it simple, that's a good starting point. Um, so for this, you're going to have a 
the delay timer between each of it in the insecure coding that's going to be handled in the HMI as opposed to the PLC. And every time that it moves on to the next stage, the HMI is going to actually have done the right and tell it to move on to the next stage. For the secure coding, you're going to actually have done all of the coding within the PLC. So uh, for this graphic here, you actually have a number of different items. You've got an operator that's going to be interacting with your HMI on the left side. You've got a network that's associated with it, connected to a PLC over Ethernet IP or something equivalent. And then you've got a hardwired control from the PLC to your process equipment. In this case, it's just a compressor right now and a number of different transmitters around the compressor. And you have a stage shutdown control. Just because there's nothing shown above the switches in any of these doesn't mean it's not connected to the wider LAN network. So you still just, this is kind of closing in your view. Uh, when you step into this, let's say you're going to start initiating the shutdown. The operator is going to initiate a shutdown from the HMI. This command is going to go to the PLC. This is in that insecure scenario. And that timer in the HMI is going to start going off. After that timer elapses, it moves on to the second stage of the shutdown, passes that command over to the PLC again. Same action goes on to stage three. And then enter your threat actor at this point. And your threat actor then steps in and causes a denial of service attack to your HMIs, to your switches, to your network. And it doesn't even have to be a threat actor. This can just be something weird happens on your network. You have that finicky network. You have uh, device failure. And since you're handling some of your control in your HMI, you start actually, if the right scenario happens at the right time, now you're actually in a compromised situation where your compressor can't shut down properly and it's stuck in this third stage in this example. So, if you're doing FAT or SAT testing, so factory acceptance or site acceptance testing, you may not actually catch this scenario. You may go through your whole testing scenario. If you didn't go review all the logic, you didn't specify how your vendors are supposed to program this, you're going to go through your entire safety testing and acceptance testing and not run into a problem at all and not even notice this scenario. And it may be fine for years or decades, but the, when the right thing happens or the right timing happens, you're going to have an event that can could be catastrophic depending on the scenarios. And I can actually speak to this. You may say this is really obvious not to do this. Well, if you're early on in your programming career, it's not always obvious because I've done this in the past. I did it in HMI. It worked fine while I was testing it for months. And then one time when I was out on site doing my testing, it was a well test where I had a number of wells flowing into a, a main treater and one that would flow into the well test. And I had some controls that happened in the HMI when I clicked some stuff on the, on the HMI. It worked every single time except for when my scan times didn't line up. So that, you know, the 100 times I tested before, it was fine until I was sitting out there and they were about to start the facility up and it didn't work. And I had last minute, I had to make changes last minute. And that could have been a problem that showed up, you know, months, years down the line. So you can only imagine trying to troubleshoot something like that. So to do this properly, we're going to go through the exact same scenario. The code's been moved over to the PLC, so you no longer have the code in the HMI. When that shutdown gets initiated, it, it gets pushed over to the PLC. You go through the different stages and the different stage commands, and it keeps bringing the process down. You have the same threat actor step in. You go through the same denial of service attack. But since all the code is in the PLC, it doesn't really matter what just happened to your network or to those other devices. You're still going to go through a safe shutdown phase. All right, so practice number six is validating the timers and counters. So this has got a whole bunch of different angles on it, uh, and I'm actually going to let Vivek speak to this a little bit at the end of it. Uh, but depending on the different eras of PLCs you have, depending on how they're programmed, the key here is your timers and counters can end up outside of your normal operating ranges or expected ranges the way they're programmed, either from somebody maliciously writing to it or some weird scenario happening in your PLC where it stepped outside of that, that time range. So really, the whole guidance here is to focus on all of your timers and counters in your PLC. You want to make sure you put guardrails in there, and you make sure that those timers and counters cannot go outside of what their operating ranges are, how they're designed to be put in there. Uh, so really, this is just improving the integrity of your PLC. And then we'll create a scenario where an attacker is able to step in and uh, leverage the misconfiguration around this. So the control scenario we'll have here is a high pressure shutdown delay timer. So you may want to have a delay timer in your on your shutdown so that a quick blip doesn't shut you down. You have so almost like it's almost like a dead band that's programmed in there. And depending on your control schemes, you may actually have it being a writable tag, and it's not a hard coded tag, so the operators have a little bit of room to play with that on their own. And so from an insecure coding standpoint. You're going to have no guardrails included for the high pressure shutdown delay timer. And this is your coding. You are going to have 
the guardrails in there. So in this case, I actually tried to like pull it into where it was more like a likely scenario. So it's actually written in the specifications that the operator is not allowed to input more than 10, 0 to 10 seconds in here. So the HMI has actually got the guardrails programmed in its interface. You have a restricted interface on the HMI, but you don't on the PLC. And the, and the tag in the PLC is already set at 10 seconds. So we're focused on the discharge pressure here. And so when the operator steps in and goes to write you know, a set point that's outside of the range, the operator is going to be stopped because he hits a restricted interface on the HMI, which is great. And this is the way it gets programmed a lot of times because this is just honestly simpler. You're still meeting design specs because they're not specific enough to tell you what device you need to be putting the restricted interface on. So from a program, an automation programming standpoint, you think this is covering your specifications. But the issue lies is when you actually start getting threat actors in there, again, stepping in. And let's say this threat actor steps in, and let's say you even have network IDSs in place, and you're watching for these attacks. Well, this threat actor steps in and actually compromises your OPC server, and your OPC server has already got a valid connection on your network to be able to connect to this PLC and read and write tags, say, from a SCADA system or some external system that's pulling these values. So you've already got a conduit that he's allowed to attack. attack. Uh, you're not restricting at the right interface, and he's able to sit here and attack this and write to the, the tag value. So now that he's able to change that tag value within the PLC, um, when you actually get to that scenario where you have a high pressure alarm on this discharge, you can overpressure the line because your time delay is too long. And this can go into a lot more nuance when you start talking about it too, because you can start diving into uh, the way tags are handled within the PLC and whether or not you're actually able to masquerade or hide what that tag value is in the PLC and, and how sophisticated that attack is. But the point is when you're sitting here writing these external writes, you don't, it doesn't matter if you have security on your PLC these t and you have, like, you have to log in to get to your interface. This doesn't require them having the engineering software. This just requires them to make a write of this. They don't have to have a lot of knowledge about your process to just start poking at different tags or registers in your PLC to cause something, a scenario like this to happen. So we'll inverse this and actually put it in the, in the right programming or the more secure programming approach, and that's moving the guardrails from the HMI to the PLC. So when you move the, the guardrails from the HMI to the PLC, the operator can still try to enter it from the HMI. The HMI is not going to restrict it, but when you get to the PLC, your PLC is going to restrict what the acceptable values are. When your threat actor steps in and does the right, he's going to have the same issues. And again, even if your network IDS tools are not capturing this and you have a valid path to it, your PLC is still going to stop it and not allow it to step out of bounds. And then when your shutdown scenario happens, you end up going through a safe shutdown. Actually, I'll back this up. And I think you've got, Vivica, you've got a couple yeah. examples. Yeah, I mean, there are the many examples of timers and counters, right? Um, what most people don't realize is, you know, think about a timer that goes up, right? So you know, X number of seconds or, you know, Y number of minutes later, process starts or whatnot. Imagine a scenario where someone decreases that time, right? So you'll never get to the next step, right? It needs five seconds to activate something to go there. I worked a long time in gas turbines, and gas turbine maintenance cycle is depending on number of fired hours. So imagine a situation where, you know, you have this complex calculation of what fuel was used, how many megawatts you had on the load, and how many hours of fired hours on diesel or, or gas, whatnot, right? So imagine a situation where someone forces a value, right, and that doesn't change. So let's say it's five hours and it doesn't change, and over the next six months, nobody notices it, and suddenly your gas turbine is now at risk of destroying itself because you haven't maintained, you haven't shut down, you haven't done the due diligence on the next step. So there's a lot to it uh, in validating timers and counters. It's very critical that um, what might be a simple timer, uh, and of course we're talking about putting the timers in the HMI versus putting the timers in the PLC, where it's a lot more accurate based on scan time, but more importantly, you always have to validate if the numbers are going the direction that they're supposed to, right, both timers and counters. So. And already do it in the regular programming space, but it's something we overlook within the automation the security, space yeah. and in the PLCs. All right, so practice number seven is validating paired inputs and outputs. So when we talk about validating what is a paired input and what is a paired output. So an example of paired inputs may be you have two limit switches on a valve, on a control valve, right? You can't have both of those active at the same time. So you can't have both the close and the open uh, signals on at the same time. And if you do, it either could be somebody being malicious or it could be equipment failure that's causing it. 
when we're talking about paired outputs, we may be talking about uh, valve commands open to close or start and stop commands to a compressor. And really the idea is you should be able to identify these early on in your programming practice, uh, what is a mutually exclusive paired input and output, and be able to start uh, either for inputs, putting alarms around it and triggering a safe scenario when you're like, all right, my equipment's malfunctioning, I need to move this to a safe state. Or for out outputs, you wanna make sure that those outputs can't go on at the same time and that whatever, if they are going on at the same time or something happens, you have additional compensating like program controls in place to limit what could happen around that. So from a control scenario, we're gonna focus on the outputs because inputs are, are fairly easy, right? From when if you get two inputs that are mutually exclusive, you're gonna alarm, you wanna want the operator to know, and you wanna make sure you go into a safe state if you're in that, or in that awkward scenario or if something's breaking and not functioning. Uh, when you're talking about starting, stopping a compressor or an output, you have a little more control of how you program this and the type of states you can step into. Uh, so from an insecure standpoint, we're gonna focus on the start and stop commands don't have any interlocks on them. They don't have any time delays between the different, or the, between cycling between the starting and stopping. And for the secure coding, we're gonna end up having interlocks in there so you can't have both outputs on at the same time. And if one does, if you do go to a soft state, there's gonna be another interlock in there for a time delay so that you can't quickly toggle and on and off the motor or whatever output you're trying to, trying to trigger. So we're gonna go back into that same scenario, but we're gonna refocus it on to the start and stop outputs. So in this case, we have two wires going out to it. There's many different scenarios with different levels of wires and different ways they're controlled. It really just depends on what was designed ahead of time and what equipment you have out there. But in this scenario, we're gonna actually start in the stopped state. So you're actually in the safe stop state where this isn't supposed to be running. And your threat actor steps in and he actually sits there and starts toggling on and off your start command. And if you don't have any logic in there for interlocks or to, to be actually monitoring how, what's happening on, this other, on the, um, both outputs, if they both come on, you can end up having both these outputs on at the same time, depending on how your VFD or whatever you're interfacing with for the compressor is or the different motor, it could start and stop consistently and start damaging the motor or it could go into an internal failed state. And if you're not monitoring that VFD or whatever the motor is you're talking to, you may not know it's actually gone into a locked out state. So even if they stop triggering this on and off and it did protect itself, the next time they try to start the process up, it's gonna end up having some sort of failed to start and not actually start when the PLC is asking it to start again. And that's gonna lead to additional downtime. It's gonna lead to more troubleshooting. They may have to call somebody out to come look at the diagnostics in the VFD to see why it's not running. And so from a securely programmed PLC practice or when you're implementing the items that we've kind of outlined in here, you've actually got the interlocks in place. So right now we're actually in a started position and the, the compressor is, is running. Uh, there are interlocks in place so that if the compressor does go to a stop point, it's got to complete a full 120 seconds before it actually rolls over and will allow it to start again. So even if you trigger stuff on and off, it's not going to allow it to start and stop consistently, potentially damaging equipment. And if it goes into the, the stop state, it's going to be locked into that stop state for that, full time, for that full time period. And there is an interlock that it won't allow both outputs to go on at the same time. So if the stop output does go on, it's going to lock it into that 120 seconds and not allow it to move into the start state. So when the attacker goes in there and writes, the start and stop commands on and off or pushes the code around and tries to force this into that position, it's gonna default to the safe state and the stop state and be locked in that for 120 seconds. So if any of these is causing this for a long period of time, you're gonna keep from damaging the equipment at that period in time. And you should have some alarms around this too if some of these scenarios start happening. You start seeing any of these two come on at the same time so you know there's something to go dive in into and investigate. So just here's some examples from some of the code that was written on the backside that if anybody wants access to later, we can give access to. But the one on the, the left side here is actually where you're looking at that different code. So you, once you've gone into the stop state and the stop command's been, entered, or been initialized internally, it ends up energizing the output for the stop it's going to trigger a time delay and an interlock to not allow it to start again until that time delay is finished. And so you have two separate interlocks sitting on the bottom. One of them is to make sure that there's no stop happening at, the same, at, at any time and there is, the time delay has been met and it's finished the timing. Uh, 
on the right side, there's just a good example here. There's, there's a set of well-defined comments in there in the PLC so that anybody who's coming in and troubleshooting this later has good comments to go around and actually follow the code that's in place, understand why it's there, what's going on, help them di diagnose and troubleshoot. Inversely, you could argue, why would you want to put co comments in the code? Because then it makes it easier for an attacker to figure out what's going on with the code. And the reality is you can't do security through obscurity. And if you do security through obscurity, all you're going to do is probably cause the much more likely scenario of somebody from your maintenance team or someone from your integration team accidentally shutting something down or causing a different issue. It's much less likely somebody's got into your code and is trying to engineer an attack. And if they have, I don't think comments are necessarily going to be the thing that stops them. Uh, in the bottom is a, just a screenshot from the HMI where we have a couple like just test scenarios where you can walk through a couple different wiring scenarios in there between single wire or dual wire outputs and kind of how the code would function. So if you wanted to monitor the code and see how the code was written, this would give you an interface to play with that. All right, so practice number eight is validating HMI input variables in the PLC. We kind of already went over this, so I'll move through this pretty quick and just kind of bring up some additional peripheral items around it. But this is really for like any input variables that come into the to the uh, PLC. So think about set points in general. Like you're going to want to make sure you have a restricted interface within the PLC, not in the HMI. Program in the guardrails. You want to make sure the guardrails are hard coded and not tags. You may think it's easier to write. Uh, code where all everything's all this nice common tag format, everything's tags, but if you don't restrict what the writing, uh, restrict it to not be a writable tag, you still somebody can sit there and mess with your guardrails and change your guardrails without having to have access to your PLC logic. So you want to hard code in the guardrails and that will limit the attacker's ability with low knowledge to, to write directly maliciously to the PLC over approved channels without having to actually get into the code and understand the code and see what they're doing. So this control scenario we'll go through is just going to be a high temperature shutdown. In the insecure coding, it'll be having the guardrails in the HMI. In the secure coding, it'll have the guardrails in the PLC. So same scenario, right? You go through that, entering that set point. The malicious actor can, st can step in and he can still write to it since it's, it's happening outside of, the, outside of the HMI. And one thing to note here, we'll actually have some screenshots on this later too, depending on the vintage of code you're writing on, you could actually have the PLC have multiple tags for the same type of variable. So you could have PLC to HMI, HMI to PLC, and PLC logic tags in there. And so an attacker, if he can already sit here and write to a lot of these tags, even though he's changed the set points, he can write to it, to it in such a way that the HMI doesn't ever even see that this value has changed. So depending on what your scenarios are too, on how the logic or how this tag is moved around and what triggers it to move into these different variable points, you actually can run into scenarios where you can definitely, and it's, it's hidden and masqueraded without even ever having to do a man in the middle attack. So if you move into the secure coding approach, this uh, the secure coding approach is again moving the guardrails into the PLC. It definitely limits this how you move variables about. If you have multiple tags, you want to be careful how you're moving the variables about and thinking about that that they're always they're always congruent or always all the same, and you don't have a weird scenario that can happen. So you want to almost sit there and work through the different logic around that. And so the same. I'm not going to walk through this one again, but this is the same approach where when you sit there and write these commands, the PLC is protecting you from that. And depending on how you want to approach this, every vendor, every vintage, every firmware version all have different ways to solve this problem. So this isn't a prescriptive, here's exactly how you do it. Some of these may have the, you can limit the ranges within the variable itself. Some of them you have to program it in. Others you can limit what is a writable tag, what isn't a writable tag. Some you may not. Some of them you'll be able to limit who can write to it from where. You can actually start even associating with different endpoints. So this, uh, this is kind of just a screenshot from the sample code that we've got. So what it does is it actually has some ways where you can actually sit there and see the different high and low range or the guardrails that were never hard coded. And some of them in such a way that you can sit there and play with it and see how much you can mess with it in, in, in either scenario. Uh, this is an example where I was talking about where you may have the three different tags. So for the three different tags, 
this one actually does its check before it does the move. So when the variable is written to from the HMI, the code first, not shown here, will go and check to see if that is a valid tag within the guardrails. If it is a valid tag, great, it's gonna do a move and it's gonna move it to the internal tag that's used for all your safety or control logic. And it'll do the same check before it moves it from the internal logic out to where the HMI is actually doing its read value. So you have a handful of different tags happening here. And depending on how you write this code as well, can introduce additional scenarios where an attacker can leverage it if you aren't cautious about how you program the code. And again, it goes without saying that many of these different items we're talking about are not gonna be captured during your typical FAT, SAT testing. So they're gonna still go through all their safety tests and think they're just fine when they've done it. But if you don't engineer this in on the front side, you just have opportunities for almost a ticking time bomb to happen later. But they would say logic bomb, but it's not necessarily intentional. No. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Vic to continue. Thank you, Josh. All right, so by now you've been thinking, is the attacker sophisticated, not so sophisticated? I don't think it matters, right? What we're trying to say is, look at all the scenarios for all the things that happened in the past decade and, and see what things can be improved because we're talking about improving PLC, right? PLC programming. And security is built in and built in this idea of um, engineering practices, best practices. So this one is a little bit more esoteric, so instrument for plausibility checks. You might be thinking, well, we're not gonna add instrumentation as part of PLC programming, right? That's not the recommendation either. But in general, most process um, areas will have a lot of instruments that have correlated or corresponding readings. So our example here is a chemical tank, but we have other examples as well. The key is try to find out things that are connected by physics or chemistry, right? If something has to burn and so the temperature will increase, right? And um, that's physics and chemistry. So if you burn something, the temperature in there should increase. So the amount of fuel that you put in a burner and the temperature increase are correlated, right? And you can use that physics to your advantage. Right? You can also say, uh, I'm measuring pressure here, and then I'm increasing the pressure so and so, but downstream, maybe at another level, you know, after a valve or maybe after a process, the pressure there should also increase, right? Like after the process. And otherwise it's venting someplace. Like the pressure increase here and the pressure increase there uh, are correlated, right? That's the process. So use that to your advantage, and that does not need additional instrumentation, but you have existing instrumentation that you can leverage for that. So that also gives you the advantage of bringing process anomaly detection natively in the PLC, because it has all the inputs coming from the field, pressure, flow, temperature, and so on. And then worst case, even without the security benefits, it can enable quicker identification of manipulated variables. So someone is manipulating one value and not manipulating the other value, and you have some correlation logic, you say, oh, this is increasing, but that's not, so something's wrong, right? Or maybe this one transmitter failed and that other transmitter is correct. So you say, okay, I found something wrong, and I found out that this transmitter, there was something wrong with the impulse line, for example, right? So in our example here, we use a chemical tank level, and the base case is only monitored by a level transmitter. So you know, if you have flow into the tank, level increases. You know, if you have a drain, then the level decreases. Simple enough. And in the secure coding world, you're using an existing flow meter or flow transmitter in both the inlet and the outlet, if they so happen to exist, right? Utilize them to say, um, let's correlate these two, right? So in the attack scenario, someone is forcing a low value for the, for the tank level, but the tank level is increasing. So you might have an overflow condition or some kind of discharge. Similarly, in another situation, maybe they force the value to the existing whatever high value, and then it's draining, and you wouldn't know that you're losing liquid or you're draining liquid, uh, an environmental issue or some other problem, right? So in this pictorial, what we're trying to say is, look at the level, 77, right? 77% of the tank is full, and you have an inlet valve, and sorry for the depiction, we're using a crude HMI for this, right? So the, the valve, um, is green, it's open, and you have this FT1, the flow going in, and as long as the bottom right drain is closed, uh, there would be no flow, FT2 would not have any flow in it, but then you can integrate the flow going in from FT1 and, and correlate that with the level. You say, I had this much flow for an hour, so the tank level should increase this much, right? What that is is a function. 
So as a controls engineer, you have to work with your process engineer to say what the function is, right? What instrumentation is available, look at your P&ID diagrams, and look at all the instrumentation available and say, I, this is critical, this particular loop is critical, and you don't want to do this for every single instrument, every single process, right? But in general, you ask the question, hey, I want to have a verification of what other instrumentation is available for me to do that. So in this case, the process engineer will say, yep, FT1, FT2, I can give you the model, I can tell you how these things are correlated with the level, right, depending on the condition, the fluid, the tank volume, all that good stuff. That's easy enough, like they do this all the time. So ask that person for that, and then you can verify, right? So once you come up with a function, you compare, you say, as a function of this flow on the inlet, flow on the outlet, the level increase or decrease should be this. You come up with that logic and you put that in the PLC. I mean, imagine a scenario where an attacker is trying to force a level condition. So let's say they're trying to force that 77 to 100 or to zero, whichever the case might be. Then they have to also force both FT1 and FT2, and they need to know the model, right? So they need to be on your network for a long time, understand how your process works, and then you're making it much more difficult for them because they're having to come up with a scenario and force that many more values in a way that doesn't trigger this alarm, right? Otherwise, it'll easily come up with some something is wrong, and then you can troubleshoot, you can figure out. We don't call it forensics in our world, right? You investigate, you troubleshoot, and you figure out if something is wrong with the flow transmitters or or the label transmitter for that matter, or if someone is trying to manipulate the value. So using process existing instrumentation to your advantage, because none of this requires additional machine learning or advanced AI, right? This, this logic is very simple, straightforward to be implemented in the PLC itself. Next one is validating, oops, sorry. Sorry, going back to the last example. Absolutely. All right, the question is, does it assume that the attacker has not already gotten in, is not doing a man-in-the-middle attack, right? There are many scenarios, to answer your question, there are many scenarios about replay attacks, for example, and we know how this has happened in the past where someone records the whole uh, you know, process for like an hour and then replay it the next hour. Uh, that's possible. We have many practices here that kind of address each component of it, right? In this particular case, in this scenario, we're talking about someone that's trying to force one or two values, right? Not all the values simultaneously. So uh, that's the other advantage of all these 20 practices is that each one of them tries to address a particular component or maybe a couple, and then implementing many of these over your whole logic gets you the destination that you want. So we have many practices here that also will alert if someone is trying to do a, a replay type attack. But in this particular case, it's just making it difficult for an attacker just to get away with forcing one thing or two things because there are many other interlocks to compare that this process value shouldn't be this at this moment because the others are saying something else. Next one is uh, validating inputs for physical plausibility. This is also related, right? So the previous one was about you know checking uh, two different things to compare and say, does it make sense? In this case, it's going one step further to say, is it even physically possible, right? Um, We'll take a recent example about the uh, you know, Florida Oldsmar situation where someone was trying to enter a big value. We have many practices, recommendations, where we talk about validating inputs and set points and uh, putting that in the PLC. But even taking a step back and thinking, if I enter 10,000, what is the process doing? Can the process actually dose 10,000? Maybe it cannot because you size the valves, you size the flow lines, you size the tanks, you size the chemical to do certain things, right? And maybe even the worst case dosing can only be 100 ppm per minute, possible, right? Then that should be your physical limit for all the numbers, right? You should never code something in there that is physically not possible. So it's one thing to validate, let's say a transmitter range is zero to 10 psi and you validate it for zero to 10 psi. But your process, if the process cannot go beyond five psi, that should be your actual limits. Don't ever code anything in there that would need or enter value even possibly to get to more than the five, right? So our example here in this case, uh, we, we have many variations of this example, right? So you can use the uh, set points example. You can do the physical plausibility for a process. Um, we'll take a gate example, right? Um, a physical gate on a dam or a valve or anything has a certain time period for opening 
and certainly for closing, depending on you know, the solenoid, air pressure, the type of diaphragm, all the physical things that you size for in the process, um, it takes time, right? So in, the, in our example, a dam takes, you know, the gate takes five minutes to open. In the base case scenario, there's no alert for something that's opening late. You know, it took six minutes or 10 minutes. Or the scenario when it opened too quickly. And that's fairly common in an attack scenario where someone is just trying to force a bunch of values, right? Maybe Modbus or OPC, like you mentioned. You can always force things, and you can issue a command to a valve, uh, but then force the open switch to say, no, it's still zero, so it's not open, right? So in the um, secure programming world, you've configured in such a way to say, okay, if I issue a command and this gate should open in five minutes, I'll have an alert if it doesn't open in five minutes. Similarly, the one thing that most people do not consider the scenario is the opposite, meaning it opened too quickly, right? It opened in one minute. This gate should take five minutes to open because of the process, the condition, the piston, the whole thing, but it only took one minute to open. Uh, it could be a failure, something just you know popped up and then the whole thing you know open, fail open, it's possible. Or again, a malicious attacker is trying to use a replay attack or something from another scenario and used it here, right? So it opened too quickly. So consider both, both those examples. So uh, again, I'm using some of the graphics from the past um, examples from Josh. Uh, the attacker is trying to manipulate the PLC values. He's trying to say, you know, I'm opening the valve, but you know, I'm not letting the open switch activate. So the open switch is gonna show zero, right? In, in our condition, in this example, if you open the valve, the level keeps increasing, right? And we had other examples before where we talk about how you can compare physical characteristics and making sure that the level is accurate comparing to flow. But let's say you don't have it. And this level increases, and you don't know why it's increasing because you did not see the valve open, right? But if you had programmed it with this example, you would have an alert for, hey, I issued an open command to the valve, and it did not open. So that too slow to open or too fast to open to consider. Again, you wouldn't want to do this for every single application, but you have to consider your process to say which ones are critical, which ones are um, you know, safety critical for your process, what's important for me to not lose uh, maybe the fluid or you know, cause any other environmental conditions. So again, uh, just a pictorial of the graph that we have in our uh, um, programming here. So uh, like Josh mentioned, we added some notes in there. So those of you that are security people and not programming people, if you want to uh, let some of your engineering folks understand this, you know, let us know. We'll send this to them. They'll get it because we try to program with enough notes so that they understand what the intent behind the programming practice is and then uh, you know, how it's actually implemented. Next up, uh, disable unused ports and protocols. So again, I guess in the IT world, it's pretty straightforward, right? So you know, you use certain protocols and you disable the others, IPv6, for example. Uh, in our world, multiple communication protocols could be enabled by default on a lot of things because uh, especially when a platform has support for multiple protocols, uh, for an engineering firm, for a um, integrator, it's a lot easier for them to keep everything open, right? That way they can configure whichever they want whatever the uh, conditions might be. And then in some cases, um, they actually recommend keeping everything open so that uh, they don't have to go troubleshoot later on, like something is not working and it's available, and you can log in remotely, for example, and, and get, get it going. But the recommendation from this practice is disable all the portion protocols that are not required, right? Seems straightforward, but a lot of people don't do it. So the key is to come up with a um, you know, a pictorial representation where you clearly show all the ports and protocols that are actually required, enabled in use, and disable all the others if possible. It has multiple advantages in security. So if you give it to the SOC, for example, if they're doing level one support and they know that they're seeing this traffic um, that's on a protocol that is not supported, not required, that's an easy alert for them that someone is actually trying to manipulate, right? Usually, communication on a different protocol wouldn't happen by accident. So that's a red alert, you know, easy to understand what's going on and, and, and dig further in. And then also, um, you know, some of the side benefits besides security, and malformed traffic. If you have a big network where, you know, maybe one PLC requires uh, a certain protocol uh, for an operation, the other PLC doesn't, um, the packets from the first will not influence the second one. That way you keep it clean, there's no 
reason why the second PLC uh, will get confused with this previous protocol that's not in use and maybe crashed, right? So that, that is one advantage. And then reducing the overall complexity. In your situation, if you're using only you know, Modbus, and if you're only using uh, you know, serial communication, you don't need any other additional advanced protocols. By disabling it, you don't have to maintain it, right? Uh, outcomes of CVE, outcomes of vulnerability notification uh, about a particular protocol that you're not using, you've disabled it, maybe you're good. Right? Maybe you don't have to upgrade something, maybe you don't have to address something if it's not used and disabled. So in our base case scenario, all the ports and protocols are enabled by default. Uh, in our secure programming scenario, as the title says, you know you only enable uh, whatever that you need, and everything else is disabled. And the attack scenario is that someone is trying to attack because the outsiders don't know what protocols you're using, right? Not till they test them out. So they have to find out what ports and protocols are in use. So they see these ports and protocols in use. So they try to um, initiate an attack on a protocol that they're familiar with and you get an alert right away that someone is trying to utilize that protocol. Um, this example, you might not be able to clearly see it, but we try to show uh, you know, a configuration option. Each PLC is different, right? So not all PLCs support all the protocols, and not all PLCs have all the um, options to disable particular ones, but go through it, right? This is one of the things as a programmer, as a PLC coding person, go through it to say, okay, this is what I need for this project, right? And it will be different from project to project. For all those others, you might need other protocols, but go through the list, check out what options are available, what protocols um, could be disabled, and disable them. And for the most part, most PLCs, when you enable or disable these, you still have to perform a download. So if someone, an attacker, was you know creative enough and they have access to these files, they want to enable this protocol for their purpose, they still most likely have to download it, right? So there are other ways you can catch it because if they have to download, obviously that's another alert that you can trigger. So it, it's a lot easier to manage this, folks. It's not that difficult to disable ports that are un, or protocols that are not in use. Defining safe process states for a PLC restart. This is uh, also something that is not considered usually by a lot of programmers. Um, I think one of the examples that Josh gave also talks about it, where you test out your scenario in all the good times, right? You have the PLC up and running. You have this amazing program that you've written. You're so proud of it. You test it out. All the scenarios, you do process component failure, instrument failure, um, you know, commands, different set points. But you never think about a situation when the PLC is rebooted or reset. You might actually think about a situation where the PLC is rebooted. You wait till it's in a healthy state, and then you think about the functionality after. But let's say the PLC is in the middle of an important function and all the attacker did is to cause it to crash. A typical DDoS, right, of the network, or did, they did something to the engineering workstation, they tried to download something, and this has happened. You've seen many examples even in Triton, right? That's a safety PLC, but whatever the PLC that is out there, it is imaginable in a lot of cases that um, someone can force the PLC to reboot, right? Because we don't have encrypted communications, you can do a lot of a lot of attack vectors are uh, quite plausible to crash a PLC. So think about the condition where it takes five minutes or ten minutes or whatever for the PLC to reboot. And now, what is the condition of your process? Let's say we use the same example that Josh had about the shutdown of the process, and you did everything right. You programmed the PLC. You did not use the HMI to. Uh, code anything in the in the in the PLC program. However, there is a DDoS or there is a forced reboot of this PLC, and now the PLC is booting back up and it's not yet in the healthy state, or it might be going towards the healthy state. What is the condition of the process right now? In this st stage two, stage three, let's say you know I'm taking a pr you know compressor example. So compressors are good. Let's call it a natural gas compressor. So when you shut down the compressor, you typically do not vent because it's a natural gas, it's pressurized. You have to send it to flare, a lot of other conditions why you do not want to depressurize it. But that's still a safe state, right? A pressurized shutdown is a safe state. A depressurized shutdown is also a safe state. What is not a safe state is an unknown condition, wherein you don't know in what condition the compressor is. As in, you initiated the shutdown, you know, the inlet valve closed, the outlet valve closed, 
you know, you are going through the process of the driver shut down um, and the PLC rebooted, and now the state is unknown, right? That is what you want to avoid. What you want to happen is when the PLC come back up, you double check, right? You create additional logic in such a way to compare what state it should have been in, and if it's not in one of those safe states, go back to the safe state, number one. And number two, go to a state, any state, where it can continue the process from then, right? Compared to getting stuck and needing a controls engineer to come back up and force something. The last thing you want is PLC rebooted, the operator cannot do anything. Like they're scrambling to reset, they're scrambling to you know push a button, um, you know click on a valve to open, and it doesn't because the PLC is now unable to function because it's thinking you know or it's not thinking where it is. It's not clear what condition it is in. So what you have to do is program in such a way that it can go to a safe state and more importantly a state where it can continue operation versus getting stuck. Right, something to consider. So closing thoughts, we both have quite a few. Um, I'll start first, and Josh will add you know, his, his thoughts as well. These practices are all um, you know, varied, but they're not all encompassing, right? Uh, a lot of people have asked the question, uh, why 20? You know, why not more? Or have you considered anything other than you know, programming the PLC? Uh, the, there are, right? Obviously, there are a lot more thoughts about this than just programming the PLC. Your security posture is not just based on the PLC programming, but this is defense in depth, right? One of the important things to do as part of an engineering solution is to think about secure programming of PLCs and consider these implementations as part of the project development as opposed to thinking that think about that after the fact. It's a lot easier to incorporate these when you're developing a greenfield project or an upgrade project versus thinking about it after the fact because it's a lot more engineering hours, a lot more additional testing, SAT, FAT, so on and so forth. And then um, supplement these practices with third party tools. Josh, you want to talk about it? Yeah, sure. So you, I mean, you're all seeing the new shiny tools that are out there today that are being used, that everybody's just buying and putting out there. The, we've already gone through a couple scenarios today where those tools don't solve all of your problems, right? There's other ways that you can go about programming the PLC, but that doesn't get it all, right? So you, you want to start supplementing these, figure out what swim lanes they cover, what, the, what these different tools cover, and make sure that they complement each other with what you're doing. So I, I think in a lot of cases, too, you may already have some of these tools in your tool, but you just don't know you have, that the vendors are already providing you, you've already paid for, that you're just not leveraging. A lot of these vendors already may have application security in place. They may have different tools that already scan through the code and look for common misconfigurations in the code. It may not align with this top 20, but it may find a lot of different scenarios that you just haven't thought about yet. Uh, you have the different tools that are out there to do backups of your PLCs using the native protocols, do comparisons watching for any changes. Some of them have already have checksums in the PLC that you can monitor for. Uh, some of them have pre-built-in security that you may not be using that doesn't require just putting in a password that may use more of an Active Directory-based security approach that doesn't have to have a connection to your Active Directory all the time. These all exist out there, so you want to take this on top of everything else you've been picking up and learning and been chasing down over the last couple of years and figure out what's the easiest to apply, what is it covering, and how am I improving my posture. The more of these tools and practices you put in place that are actually maintainable and achievable, the easier it's gonna be for you to stop somebody in their tracks and for them to trip up and make a mistake. The, longer, the harder you make it for them to actually compromise your system, the more likely it is they're gonna get caught on their way. I agree, I mean, in fact, not being a sales pitch, you know, I see this all the time for the day job that I have, right? A customer purchases a tool, they bought it for a purpose, but they don't leverage it completely. There are many benefits that the tool comes with uh, and supplement that with these practices, right? These practices are for level one programming and improvement, but there are tools that you uh, install in level two or about that you can supplement to enhance your defense in depth for sure. Yeah, and, and again, a lot of this is changing culture, right? Like a lot of your automation folks that are out there today, you're out there solving problems, getting the process up and running, making sure everything, you're the last step to it running, so all the pressure's on you all the time. The last thing you're concerned with usually is cybersecurity. So you have to start kind of baking that in early and start making it aware that there is a difference you can make, there is a change you can make. And from a cybersecurity standpoint, most of us cybersecurity engineers stop thinking about things beyond what we know about, right? When you talk about PLC security, you're just talking about passwords. When you start talking about like doing backups, you're not even thinking about your control system backups, even though they may be some of the most critical 
items that you have in your control in your entire environment. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, contribution opportunities. I, there's a question in the in the app that I I don't know if I'm saying it right, but app had a question, so I'll answer that first. So um, one of the questions was, uh, can we automate this? Right? Are these practices um, easy to automate or or cross check? So how do we know if these practices are are done correctly in a PLC? It's not that straightforward because each PLC has its own way of programming, own validation tools for quality checks and for you know compiling checks, right? Um, but it's possible. We have a project, it's an ongoing project. A lot of people are still contributing. A lot of people still actively involved. Um, and we've reached out to all the vendors. And we're getting feedback from vendors saying, yes, we're incorporating this as part of our programming. Because this is not about a toolkit. This is not about a function. This is not about a, um, a particular feature, right? Uh, those features and functions might be available in all the PLCs, but the key is how do you confirm that they're actually being implemented as part of uh, this program, right? So we're hearing back from vendors that they're including it as part of their, along with quality and you know compiling checks, they're also including security checks, right? We're seeing that. And we're also hearing about newer third-party independent groups doing this on behalf of other vendors. So they're collecting the logic from the engineering files, comparing and reviewing with um, you know, known vulnerabilities or known issues, or comparing with these practices to say, yep, this checks you know, 15 of the top 20 practices, right? That's something that is an automation that can benefit you. That way, you know, you've asked in the RFQ, you've asked your vendor, your integrator to provide uh, programming that is done securely, but you can then have an independent verification from this third party or maybe from the vendor tool, right? But right now, that's a work in progress, and maybe that's some place you can help us. Maybe you work with us on this project. This is a community project, right? This is not a vendor-initiated one. Become part of this group and contribute so that more of the vendors know that this is important, more of the asset owners are asking for this information, and so the vendors and the integrators would have no choice but to comply with it. Now, any questions, folks? Yes, sir. So uh, you guys mentioned, you know, most of system integrators and team builders, you know, their priority is you know, trying to get work done in time. And uh, unless, unless, like, unless it's like explicitly specified by the owners or operators. That, oh. Unless it's uh, specified by the owners, asset owners or operators, um, I don't see many people implementing this. So would you recommend that this is something that, there are, there are some programmers that would, um, just for the sake of it's, it's the right thing to do, but in most cases, is this something that you would recommend the owners and asset, asset owners to implement as part of the deliverables for any new projects or new machines or you know whatever the, the case is? that they're bringing a, a programmer in? Uh, great question. Uh, for those of you that couldn't hear the initial part, yeah, the question is, is it recommended to you know, put that in the RFP process so they will deliver, otherwise it won't get done, right? It won't be get done. So that's the truth of the matter. We absolutely recommend putting that uh, as part of the RFP process. And granted, in my assessment, there are many of these practices that don't have to add engineering hours, right? So once you do it as part of your programming, you know, if you're thinking about you know, validation of a timer or um, monitoring certain process values or the PLC uptime or cycle time. Those are pretty straightforward. You do it once on a particular type of project. That's your library. You implement it. It doesn't take additional engineering hours. Whereas others, like validating with the physical process or validating with the, um, uh, you know, plausibility aspect of it, those things need additional time. So as an asset owner, Right? If you're demanding something off of your PLC program or your vendor, your integrator, you have to compensate for that additional engineering time. Right? You have to be prepared to get that additional security. You have to be prepared that they have to go through that engineering and validation, and you have to ask for it. In fact, um, we have a template for RFP on our project website as well where you know, yeah, use this practice list to say, we want this to be done. Right? And then... You can go back and forth, right? You can say, okay, in my process, these are the four critical control loops where I want this additional features or additional aspect of it. With the others, you can program um, as you wish, uh, as you wish, which is still functional and safe. Um, however, 
you have to absolutely specify. And that's one of the things we're working on. So we're trying to get more asset owners involved, uh, ask this question as part of the RFP process so that the vendors or the integrators can actually comply with it. Yeah, and it doesn't, it doesn't have to be difficult. It can, it, can, it can be very simple, and that's kind of what the example that we have up there too is just get started. Just start creating that culture and start requiring some of these, and then people will naturally start to inquire more about it or have other ideas themselves that they may want to add to it. Yeah. So, got another question in the corner. So it was not a question, but more of a comment since I am an asset owner right now. Uh, so one, great job carrying this forward. So me and Jake appreciate everything you guys are doing. Um, it doesn't also ha have to be part of the RFP, right? So right now, if we have in-flight retrofits or new greenfield and we're doing fat and sat, I'm putting it in doing fat and sat. So even if it wasn't in the RFP, when we're going through fat and sat and we're looking at logic, I'm making them do this, the integrators, the vendors. And in some cases, they're charging us for it. Other cases are like, yeah, we should already be doing this. We'll update the SDS or the design specs and we'll account for like where we're doing each practice. So it doesn't have to be complicated. I've, I've even done stuff where it's like, hey, give me a sample screenshot of the logic showing me which practices you can do now, right? So it, it, you can do it multiple ways. There's no one size fits all. And joining the community too, and like contributing, you actually will pick up from other contributors who are already doing this where you can ask the questions because they're already trying to implement this as you are already today because I've already seen a bunch of your emails that go out too that yep. it, you can learn how somebody else is successfully doing it today. You don't have to figure it out yourself and you can actually start showing other colleagues that are maybe potentially already do this and how they're doing it successfully and learn from their experiences. Yep. Yes, sir. Have you seen a standard or a company actually kind of codify your secure POC coding practices into a standard that is repeatable and it's at a high enough level, it doesn't matter if it's a Rockwell or Siemens, whoever the manufacturer is, but you know, these are the, the kind of coding practices that would need to be addressed, whether it was your in-house you know, staff or it was an external consultant or the, or the manufacturer. Yeah, good question. Uh, the question is again, have we seen vendors or integrators um, using this as a standard and saying, yep, we comply? Um, we have one so far. Uh, we've reached out to many of these integrators, vendors, engineering firms, vendors. We've asked the question, are you doing it? The commonly heard answer is, we're doing most of it for other reasons, right? So most of that is done as part of their engineering effort, and that's because of functionality and other features that they need from doing this. Uh, the missing piece is the security piece, that they're getting the security benefit in all these practices, but they haven't thought about it that way, so they haven't implemented it with security in mind. Uh, so, so far, we only had one published document to say, yep, we are doing this as part of our standard operating procedure. We use this 20 list to compare. Now, there might be more, right? I mean, we compile this 20 from a lot of aggregation. In fact, we have a huge set of other practices that didn't make it because they were related to networking, power supplies, level two, uh, not specifically level one. So when we came together as a project, we said, let's focus on PLC programming for this aspect. Let's add those others. Whereas those vendors and integrators are doing the bigger project. So for them, this is one piece of the puzzle, but they're doing a lot more as well. Uh, what we haven't seen so far is someone to come out and say, uh, for our PLCs, no matter what the make, no matter what the model, we're doing all of them. That we haven't seen, but I think that's a tough ask. I mean, honestly, the intent is to not to make this a standard or not to make this a uh, regulation. The intent is to get the best practices uh, from these practices be part of the culture. Right? So as long as asset owners are asking the question and that particular vendor for that particular project says, we understand what you're looking for and we'll give you, you know, our best version, I think that that's the, the next step, right? It's, you know, crawl, you know, crawl, walk, and run. So we're in that crawl to walk phase. Yes, sir. Thank you again, gentlemen. Um, since I gave the, a paper two years ago, I, I never expected it to look like this. Um, and it, it, it really is, it amazes me that it's gone this far. I want to point out a couple of things. Uh, there was a, uh, uh, for those of you that have ever had the misfortune of programming in C, there was a fantastic book. It, was, it started off as a paper written by Bell Labs uh, on uh, uh, C, Traps and Pitfalls. They showed you what you don't do. And that's actually a lot of what this list is. It's a list of things that you shouldn't do. And eventually, after doing enough of this thing, you can, you can uh, get industry standards such as 
Um, if you look in motor vehicles, they have MISRA version of C programming style. So if you're programming an engine computer, this is the sorts of things that they're expecting you to do. And oh, by the way, don't use heap because heap is bad in embedded systems. Things like that. You're going to have a hard time. Um, we've already stubbed our toes on a lot of these problems. We're still gathering up the lists. We're still trying to figure out what's working and what's not. And so what these folks have, have gathered together is fantastic. Um, but it's only a start, and we do not, we're not at the stage yet where we could codify this into a standard, say, yay, verily, go to IEC, and then give, give some long number after it, and then say, you should use this standard. We're nowhere near that yet, and we don't want to stumble over ourselves trying to build that standard. Yeah. Thank you, Jake. That was very, very accurate. I think the, the process of just pulling together was trying to pull like a thousand people's ideas together and be like, figure out, all right, what are the most important? Let's vote on these. How do we agree on language? How do we just get this across the door so that we actually start having the conversations today? It's an evergreen approach. We want a lot more contributors to come in. It's just absolutely the top 20. doesn't necessarily mean it is. It's the 20 ones that we could get whoever was engaging at the time to agree on are the top 20 and the ones we could define the best, right? And that was a win to get it across the finish line that way. But this is very, very, very new. And I'm sure there's a ton of great ideas out there, and it's open for, everybody's open to, to learn more from it and to have different contributors come in and help grow the document or help grow peripheral documents that you may not think are related to cybersecurity but are. Like one of the ones we're focusing on next is the environmental aspects. So you might start getting down to stuff that is more like I.O. based or engineering based that you would think is never even focused in cybersecurity. But if you design it properly from the engineering side, you may restrict a lot of the things that can be done from a cyber aspect or a cyber lens. So they're related in, in one way or another, so you just have to start opening up those doors and kind of triggering those light bulbs. Yeah, and it's definitely taken off. We have at least six language translations, so those of you that are global, you, you know, people that around the world program in different languages, um, languages as in not PLC languages, but uh, people that speak, so we have uh, more languages coming in translation. So try to send this out, right? So if you're a security person, reach out to your programming person. Reach out to those OT people that are actually doing PLC programming or maybe at the plant level. Uh, have them be uh, participants in this project. Try to get this info to them, right? And then like, like we mentioned, we have the back-end tools, the firmware, the files for them to play with. Or you know, if they are more familiar with a different platform, they can still use the concepts from this, right? So they can still use those examples uh, to use their own platform of choice to, to program that. Any other questions, folks? Please. I'm sure you'll be able to hear me anyway. But um, you mentioned other documents that could be addendums. And I was wondering if there's any type of matrix to build out, like ideation and prioritization of the plausibility checks you mentioned. It feels like you could do those all day for data or physical plausibility checks and still maybe miss some. So I was wondering if there's any kind of matrix or a project to, again, ideate on those potential scenarios and or build out prioritization for them. That's a great question. Uh, let me think about that. So there are things in this that will have to be thought through, right? It's not just a one person thing. Um, and like I mentioned, the controls engineer needs to work with the process engineer. And yeah, I can see what you're saying that they come through, um, they do an assessment, but it's only a few hours that they spend and maybe they didn't think through other scenarios. And maybe not prioritization, but maybe what they need is a pool of things that to think about, right? So hey, make sure that you think about like a checklist to say, hey, think about these maybe half a dozen or 10 scenarios when you're thinking. Otherwise, it's difficult a, for a newbie, especially for a new controls engineer, you don't even know what questions to ask. Yeah, I want to talk about plausibility, but what is plausible? That's not something a new controls engineer would know. An experienced controls engineer, maybe after having done multiple projects, might be able to ask the right questions, but even then they might miss something because they're not thinking about it at that point. So I think that's a good point to, to say, Maybe think about these 10 scenarios, right? Physical plausibility, other validation. That'd be a good addition. So yeah, we'll definitely put that in our uh, uh, things to work on in the next project. Thank you. All right, thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you.